So welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Linda Bylander. And Linda, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and the program today? Thanks, Craig. So I'm Linda Bylander. I'm the coordinator of the Becoming Outdoor Woman program. And I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. Our guest is Brett Nelson. He's the Large Lake Specialist out of Baudette um, Fisheries Office up there in Baudette, Minnesota. And Bo uh, runs a women's outdoor skills program and learning to sturgeon fish is one of the programs we offer. And I've learned about the management of the sturgeons over the last couple of years. And it's just a fascinating story. So I'm so glad that Brett agreed today to talk about the, the sturgeon management um, success story and share it with the public today. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, what's what's happening with the sturgeon management and then also how to sturgeon fish. So I want to welcome Brett. I think we're having a little issue getting this PowerPoint up. Brett, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, so now you can pull up your PowerPoint, I think. Yeah, I have it pulled up. I don't have the ability to share my screen. Oh, uh, the, Craig, did you give uh, Brett the power? There we go. Okay. Great, I, I'm seeing everything fine. Drop down this. All right. Can everyone hear me good? Linda, are we good? Yep, we're good to go. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. As Linda mentioned, my name is Brett Nelson, and uh, I'm up here in Bidette, Minnesota today, and really excited to talk about the, the history of the Lake Sturgeon up in uh, the Lake of the Woods Rainy River system. And the talk I'm going to give today is going to focus on the, the history of not only the Lake Sturgeon population, but the history of the Rainy River and some issues that occurred over the past century and a half with water quality and commercial fishing. And then we'll kind of fast forward into what we're doing now in terms of our management and monitoring of this species, and then some tips and tricks on how to fish for sturgeon. And that's primarily going to be focused on river fishing in particular up here on the Rainy River. But before I get into the, the meat and potatoes of the talk, I just want to say that the efforts that went into not only the recovery of Lake Sturgeon, but the water quality improvements in the Rainy River is vastly before I was even up here. I moved up here in 2014, and it's been a huge amount of effort through multiple agencies, organizations, and individuals in particular. So. Big shout out to them. I'm just grateful the one to, to be able to tell the story today. So the overview of my talk, we'll just focus, uh, there's three main components, but before we jump into that, I'll just go over some basics of sturgeon in particular on Lake Sturgeon. And then we'll go over the history of the commercial fishing effort that went up here. And then uh, some water quality issues that went on in the Rainy River. Then we'll switch gears over to what we do in terms of monitoring management and then fishing for sturgeon. So sturgeons in general are often coined to being the dinosaurs or they look prehistoric looking dinosaurs of the rivers and lakes and rightfully so. Fossil record dates sturgeons back to the early Jurassic period around 170 to 200 million years ago. So <clears throat> rightfully so they are been around for a very long time. Worldwide today, there's 25 species of sturgeon, 18 of which are found in Europe and Asia, seven are found here in North America. And the general theme kind of applies to sturgeons worldwide is that there's been an overall decline in abundance. And this is largely due to issues of overharvest, habitat degradation or pollution, and fragmentation largely due to damming of rivers. In Minnesota, we have two species of sturgeons. We have the lake on the top there, and then the smaller version, the shovel nose sturgeon found in southern Minnesota. The focus of the talk today is going to be on lake sturgeon, which in Minnesota is listed as a species of special concern. And due to uh, the population or individual life history characteristics of lake sturgeon, make them vulnerable and why they are on the list. 
So before we get onto that, we'll just go over some kind of anatomical features of sturgeons, and this is focusing on the lake sturgeon. So sturgeons are benthic or bottom dwelling animals, and they kind of have some unique characteristics. So if you look over on the left, they have these five rows of armored plates called scoots that are very pronounced as uh, young individuals as a protective coating or an armoring for them. And, <clears throat> and if we move over to the right, we can look at the business end or the head portion of the sturgeon. And these, these fish are adapted to living in dark, turbid waters where vision is usually not the best. So they have adapted to survive over the years using a variety of different techniques. They have these uh, called ampullae of Lorenzini and paired with these four barbels that hang off the, the end of their snout, similar to what you'd expect in like a catfish. And they use these to navigate these turbid waters and to use these barbels actually as taste buds to locate food. And then upon doing so, they have this large protrusive mouth that extends down and it's able to suck up their prey items and then expel out sediment or other debris out of their gill flaps and then eat their food. Um, their primary diet consists of crayfish, mollusks, snails, insects, leeches, fish, fish parts, and fish eggs. So items you'd expect to see on the bottom of a lake or a river. They've also been known to take large leaps out of the water. Now there's speculation on why sturgeons do so. Um, I've heard theories such as to shed external parasites, um, to expel air and gulp air, kind of like a big burp when they jump out of the water or a form of group cohesion or communication. Or lastly, it's just exercise or because they can and it feels good. So what I found in the literature is that in gulf sturgeon, they actually uh, deduced that it was likely some form of a communication, but they couldn't rule out any of the other ones. So kind of the mystery of the sturgeon. Um, some individual characteristics for the sturgeons in general, lake sturgeon, is that they're long-lived or have long life expectancies. They're large-bodied. They can live a very long time, over 100 years in age. In the Rainy River and Lake of the Woods system, based on our contemporary data set, we have them aged up to 70 years old. The oldest one I found on record was 152 in Ontario. And the largest individual that I found on record was a 400-pounder found over in the Rosa River, so west of here up in Manitoba, which was, uh, yeah, 400 pounds, which is over to the right there. So they get to be very large and live for a long time. They also have late maturation rates relative to other freshwater fish in that it takes males on average to be 17 years, 40 inches or so till they become sexually mature. For females, it's age 26 and 50 inches. So a rather long time before they're actually sexually mature and contributing back to the population. Um, some specific habitat requirements needed uh, kind of twofold here is that they need rapid current for spawning, so well oxygenated water. And they have these environmental cues which they use in the spring to you know, let them know that hey, it's time to, time to think about spawning. And this is based on water temperature, the length of the daylight and river discharge. So they'll move into these rapid areas. Um, once the eggs are fertilized by males, they, uh, the young hatchlings hatch after a week or so and they move out to slower currents in the river and they need these slack waters for early development. So kind of a twofold uh, uh, process on the whole spawning and early, early life history. And the pictures off the right here just show um, what these habitats look like. So this is the Rapid River just, uh, just east of Bidette and some sturgeons at the base of the, the rapid, which is also my background. I figured might as well have the sturgeon with me during the talk. So on to commercial fishing history on Lake of the Woods, uh, largely started in the late 1800s. And during the era of the commercial fishing, it was coined as the greatest sturgeon pond in the world, that this was one of the largest uh, suppliers for caviar worldwide, which was the primary use of the sturgeon for uh, commercial use. Um, there was some economic value used for the flesh as well. And then isinglass, which is a product of the swim bladders of the fish, was used as glues and adhesives and clarifiers for beers and wines as well. But the primary uh, industry for the commercial fishing was through the eggs or the caviar from the large females. The first recorded yield was in 1888 and was 43,000 pounds. Now, if you fast forward five years, 1893, the peak yield recorded was 1.8 million pounds, so rapidly expanding. 
and from 1892 to 1898, 9.2 million pounds were harvested with a sharp decline thereafter, indicating that this was not a sustainable fishery. And the picture off to the right was just a, a, one of this large females that was uh, harvested back in the day. So 265 pound fish, so they were really big. This next slide just kind of shows that timeline in a graphical form. So you can see in the 1890s up until the 1900s, um, this just that rapid expansion of the fishery with that sharp decline after there. Um, the last uh, recorded yield over 10,000 pounds was when eight, or 1918. And then a ex uh, really extensive survey took place through Dennis, uh, Kenneth Carlander back in uh, the late 19, uh, late 1930s, early 1940s, and they only documented seven sturgeon uh, in the system then. So pretty much wiped them down to almost a point of local extinction. At the same time, there was also uh, a rapid development of the timber industry on the northern border. And from this, there was uh, these dates here to signify uh, the approximate year the, the, pulp, the main pulp factories were implemented on International Falls, so the Minnesota side, and on Fort Francis, the Ontario side. And a byproduct of the waste from these timber productions was at these pulp mills, which was basically just dumped right into the Rainy River. and uh, and as a result of that, these pulp fibers basically smothered the bottom of the Rainy River, including areas that were used for spawning fishes, in addition to basically smothering out areas where you'd expect to find young sturgeons foraging. So these pictures, courtesy of the MPCA off the right, they show these mass degradation taking place through the timber industry up there. So blankets of fiber just covering the bottom of the river. Also, at the same time, as you have a growing population with very little to no environmental regulation was the untreated municipal waste. So raw sewage also being dumped into the Rainy River. And um, I found it uh, kind of unique with these two quotes here. These are through the, the IJC, which is the Joint uh, Commission, International Joint Commission. So the main governing body for border waters between Canada and the United States. So if we look at 1914, they quoted that the Rainy River was uh, uniformly clearly due to store or sewage discharge from those two main populaces and the river itself is unsafe source of water without careful purification. So early 1900s, fast forward 50 years, the Rainy River is still a potential mass to health. It's unfit for bathing, discourages development of waterfront property, unsuitable for growth of many aquatic life and unattractive for recreation. So 50 years later, still some major issues taking place in the Rainy River. So you kind of have two things going on here. You have a, a lake sturgeon population that's highly depressed from commercial fishing. And then the few that are still in the system are not able to actually spawn successfully most years and reproduce due to the, due to the poor water quality taking place in the Rainy River. So looking forward onto the positive, uh, the commercial fishery was closed on the Minnesota side in 1941 and 1995 in Ontario. Um, the habitat degradation was largely addressed through um, strict environmental regulation or environmental laws that were passed on both sides of, in the 1960s and early 70s that actually gave some teeth to these regulatory agencies to actually enforce some uh, improvements in water quality. And from there, we've seen a remarkable recovery of water quality in the Rainy River. And currently to date, the MPCA uh, rates the Rainy River um, meeting the minimum standards and sometimes exceptional standards for aquatic life and recreation scores, fish being in particular meeting the exceptional or excellent scores. But there's still challenges that still face water quality issues in the Rainy River, including uh, climate change and other surrounding changes in land use. So now we know that based on the MPCA data that, okay, water quality has greatly improved, things are really looking good in the Rainy River. So how have the sturgeon individually responded to this? So now on to the next portion of the talk is focused on our monitoring and management. So our goal listed in our current management plan is to reestablish and maintain self-sustaining stocks of lake sturgeon and all suitable habitats in the lake and river. 
These stocks should provide a recreational fishery with opportunities to encounter large fish over 72 inches. Age, size, abundance, genetic diversity should approach those found in lightly exploited populations. At the same time, provide uh, sport fishing for anglers that will be managed with sustainable levels. So the next little bit's gonna look at um, our primary sampling and how we monitor fish. We sample fish using three primary ways, using gill nets, angler caught fish, and then sometimes, uh, in some instances, we hand grab them in the springtime as well. So the, when we capture the fish, um, depending on the project we're doing, there's a, a series of steps that we take with each individual fish for the data we collect. So starting on the left, during our spring adult assessment on the spawning grounds, we determine whether the fish is a male or female by rubbing their stomachs and looking for uh, milt or eggs. Uh, next, we'll get a total length of the fish. In some projects, we get a weight and a girth of the fish. And then moving down to the bottom left, fish over 24 inches are tagged with these individual disc dangler tags. And then starting last year, we actually insert uh, small pit tags or these tags that are the size of the grain of rice and we can scan the fish and get uh, individual information from that fish as well. And we use that as a kind of a way to look at the tag loss with these yellow ones, but it's gonna provide into the future great information of these small fish on their age and growth. And how we determine the age is we take a small section from the pectoral spine of the fish, which is shown in the bottom right here, and then taken back to the lab. And I'll go over what we do with that later on in the talk. But then the fish are released and observed for their recovery. So the tagging program is kind of the bulk of the work we do up here. It was implemented in the 1980s. And from this data set, we can monitor movement, maturity rates, growth rates. We use them for estimating population size, spawning frequency, mortality rates, and then some fun facts from this. Today, we've tagged over 10,000 fish total. The longest fish we've tagged is 72 inches. The heaviest fish we've tagged um, was just last summer, and that was 110 pounds. And of all these fish, uh, 2,700 have actually been caught and reported once by anglers. So the anglers catch the fish, they see that tag in the back there, and then they report it to us. And I get about 200 to 250 tags annually. I think last year was the record. It had about 340 tag returns from anglers in one year. So um, the winner right now or the champion has been caught and reported 10 times. And this fish is near to dear to me because I was actually the last person to catch this fish on the 5th of April, 2019. So that's me holding that fish. So it's uh, it's really a neat, neat way of looking at um, how catch and release is effective for allowing anglers to have a good time and, you know, um, and the, the hooking mortality is relatively low if properly handled. And then that some fish just can't hand, just can't pass up a night crawler on the bottom of the river. This one is a very bitey fish. As you can see um, in 2009, it actually was caught and reported um, on the same day. So it just went up river one mile and got caught again on the same day. And then three times uh, in the 2017. And I actually know a couple of the anglers that have caught this fish. So it's really neat to see the tag history for these fish. So now the next few slides will focus on our main sampling programs. And the first one I'll talk about is our annual tagging at the Rapid River. And this is looking at adult spawning size fish. Uh, we've been doing this annually since 2004. Um, since then, we've tagged 2,300 fish at this location. Uh, 500 have been rec recaptured at least one time here, of which 70% uh, were originally tagged there, really showing that uh, strong site fidelity or fish wanting to come back to the same site each time to spawn. Um, we have also learned about spawning periodicity or the frequency at which these fish spawn. Uh, it's two to three years on average for males. Sometimes we'll see them annually and three to six for females. And over time, we've seen an overall increase in their mean size. We've also estimated the population size over 40 inches. Um, we've done this three times. So 1991, 04, and 14 was the last one. And we see the population size over 40 was originally around, estimated to be around 17,000, then 60,000. And most recent survey was 90, around 90,000. 
And there's some uncertainty with these estimates just due to the complexity of the sturgeon life history and the system we're sampling. It's a massive, massive system. So we don't have any specific management goals tied to these population estimates, but it's a good way for us to track the abundance of these larger fish over time. And in theory that we see that straight linear growth of the population size just shooting way up over time, we would expect based on ecological theory and carrying capacity that we would start seeing it level off. So what's the size structure? How has that changed over time? So 2004 to 2021, these are our fall large mesh adult netting going on in the lower rainy river. So in 2004, you can see a, a bulk of the biomass of the fish that were sampled were in this 40 to 50 inch range with very few individuals over 50. And before I move on to 2021, it, it's just good to note here that that fish, those fish in that 40 to 50 inch range were largely due to um, good recruitment or year classes being kicked off in the the 1980s, which is kind of kind of another success story showing that water quality is starting to clean up there and those fish are having successful reproductive years. Now we fast forward to 2021, so last October, we see a more uniform size distribution, fish from 34 up to 70 inches with more fish over 50 inches. And the figure on the right is kind of the similar, similar trend there. And this was comparing the size of uh, fish from the four sectors we sampled in our last population estimate and seeing an increase in mean size there. We also do monitoring of small fish, so subadult or juvenile uh, sturgeon as well in the lower Rainy River. And this was done through periodic fish community surveys back in the early 90s and um, now conducted on an annual basis in that we've learned that during certain river conditions, we can be really effective at sampling small sturgeons. So that's where we started incorporating it into uh, an annual basis. And what we've learned is that <clears throat> the catch rates have increased. They're variable year to year based on conditions and everything else that goes with, with sampling on rivers. But we're seeing an overall increase in abundance. And this is made up of many uh, year, age classes each year. So signs of reproductive success. And we've also learned that certain areas of the lower rainy are more productive than others for sturgeon abundance, which leads us into our some of the work we're doing now is looking at substrate mapping, basically just using side imaging to classify what the bottom is of the rainy river, if it's full of wood, gravel, sand, or silt, and try and link in that back to certain areas of high catches that may need further habitat protection um, in, in the event of the future. So. And also we've uh, expanded our large mesh or adult net netting out into the west side of the lake, which has been largely unsampled by us. And just to get a better idea of relative abundance out in the lake in the summer months and that size structure as well. We often also get asked, well, how old is my sturgeon? Well, that depends. There's a lot of things that go into individual ages of sturgeon or fish in general, but over time we can take averages of the length and the age and plot them out on this on this graph here. And how we do so is I mentioned we take that that small section of the spine off the fish and we actually run it through small cross sections in a bone saw. And you can actually get these what you called annulus or these annual rings, and you would age that similar to as you would age a tree. So based on average length at age, we see that sturgeon actually grow relatively fast up until about age 20. And that's when we would expect them to start hitting sexual maturity where they're now they're, all of their energy was put into somatic growth at that point length. And then now once they're sexually mature, that's going into reproduction. Um, I'm not gonna read off all the, the age at length here, but it kind of gives you an idea about how how old your fish may be at a given length. So by the end of their first year, they, they could be up to six inches and a 60 inch or could be around 40 years old. So the last slide on our sturgeon management is we have our short and long-term goals set out in our current management plan. And these are a conglomerate or a conglomeration of fish ages and sizes, year classes present and supporting sustainable harvest. 
the short term goals were determined to be met in 2012. We're currently operating under our short term goals being met and we will reassess our long term goals um, around 2030. And the ones highlighted in green are ones that have been assessed and that are being met at this time. And it's not that the ones in black are being met, it's just we just haven't assessed those at this point. And we will do so as we approach uh, uh, 2030. But so we're seeing some good signs of recovery and meeting our management goals at this time. So now I will switch gears on to uh, fishing for sturgeon. One second. So I am by no means a professional fishing guide, but I have been an avid angler my whole life. And I moved up to Bidette around 2014. And that was when I first started fishing for sturgeon. And once I got my first bigger fish on, I was hooked. It's, it's a ton of fun and, and highly recommend. It's a good way to get outdoors. It's really laid back fishing and a uh, good way to spend time with friends and family. Um, some locations in the state that have Lake Sturgeon, obviously the Rainy River, the Mississippi River and its tributaries, the St. Croix River and tributaries, the St. Louis River um, before it dumps into uh, Lake Superior, the Red River of the North over on the Dakota border, and some other lakes within the Red River and Minnesota River uh, watersheds also have Sturgeon, Otter Tail Lake, Big Stone, uh, Big Detroit, Upper Red Lake. So the best time of year to fish for sturgeon is really anytime it's legal to fish for them and you can get out there is the best time. But um, from what I've noticed, this is in reference to the Rainy River. I've had the most success personally fishing for sturgeon in the spring and fall. And um, the probability of catching or encountering a larger fish is probably a little better in the spring in that we have an influx of large adult spawning size fish moving in from the lake and migrating around the river to these spawning habitats. And fall is just, have just had really good luck then too, but unfortunately that's usually when the weather is not as nice. So um, it can be a little bit brutal out there, but um, not to discourage people from trying to fish for them in the summertime. I've had really good fishing in the summer and the weather is typically a lot more amenable to sitting out on the boat. It's also becoming uh, extremely popular in the wintertime as well. Um, in particular, down on the St. Croix River, um, that's become a, a really, really popular fishery down there over the past uh, past 10 years. Within water body locations, so I would recommend starting near holes or deep water parts of the river. And the idea is that if you start on the upstream or the side of the hole that once you toss your bait in, um, that that center from your bait will drift downstream and the sturgeon will pick up on that and swim up and bite. But don't delegate all your time to fishing in holes if you're not getting bites. If you're not getting any bites, you're watching the boats around you, um, move around. Um, and don't be afraid to just pick a random spot. I've had some of the best best luck I've ever had is just plopping down somewhere and, uh, and having good fishing. I know over time you kind of learn areas that you've had success, so you may spend a little more time there than others, but uh, don't be afraid to try new things. These fish are very mobile, so. Some other tidbits, know the regulations you're fishing for. There's many water body specific regulations for fishing in general, but for sturgeons in particular with uh, border waters, so for instance, on the Minnesota, <clears throat> on the Rainy River, you should only fish for sturgeon on the Minnesota side as it's prohibited on the Canadian side. Whereas other border waters that may not apply, but there's uh, definitely some knowing the regu regulations is on the angler for what you're fishing for and the water body. And as I mentioned earlier, dress for the weather. If you're planning on trying to get out and fish for these things in the spring and fall, <clears throat> it can be uh, quite brutal out there. It can have wind that's, very gusty, snow, rain. So the, the warmer you dress, the more comfortable and enjoyable it will be for you. Next is to watch that hydrograph. So what I mean by this is um, the USGS has these gauging stations, which we can monitor the river discharge and the height. And this can really have a large impact on your fishing experience in that 
in particular on the Rainy River in the springtime, large snow melt and tributaries releasing all the stuff that's just built up over the winter lets loose. And that can cause major increases in uh, in water coming down the river and ultimately debris, logs, ice, and it may not be the best time to try fishing for them. So if you can go to the USGA GS site, look at the current water data, and if you see this river rapidly increasing, it may not be the best time and might just wait a little bit for it to settle down. Um, you can expect busy boat ramps uh, in the springtime, especially on the Rainy River. We have a, a popular catch and release walleye fishery that goes to April 14th, in addition to an ever growing uh, popularity with sturgeon fishing. So um, do expect that there can be some busy ramps at times. Also, that other types of fish are often caught while fishing for sturgeon. I kind of listed over on the right some of the, the, the common cast of characters that I've caught fishing for sturgeon. So walleye, saugers, uh, a couple different sucker types, eel pout. And then um, not necessarily on the Rainy River, but mud puppies are often caught on the St. Croix River if you tend to fish down there. And crayfish, you don't necessarily catch hook and line, but they can be problematic in the summer months on the Rainy River. And that after uh, five, 10 minutes, you pull up your line and there's no bait on there is that the crayfish are likely nipping it off. Also not caught hook and line, but something that's very common is uh, native silver lampreys often attached to sturgeon. And I was able to get a photo of that a couple of years ago up in the top center there. And these are native, they've coexisted together for years. So it's, it's a natural thing. And the big thing is just to watch that rod tip because you're typically using heavy gear, which I'll go over next. And you wanna make sure that you're not causing any additional hooking injuries or mortality to this bycatch that you weren't uh, specifically targeting. So on to the tackle. And the first three things, the fishing rod, reel, line, are all sort of, combined together in that you should be able to successfully catch and land and bring in a large sturgeon in relatively short order time. You don't want to fight a fish for a really extended period of time. It's stressful on the fish. So the heavier gear you use, you can be able to get that fish in, take your, take your photos, your measurements, whatever you need to do and get it back to the water as quickly as possible. But I recommend using a medium heavy to heavy rod, one with a real stiff backbone that can withstand heavy weights of fish. And typically seven to 10 foot with a fast action. And I mean by fast action is it's got a softer tip that you can detect light bites. A hundred pound sturgeon is a very big fish, but it might not bite like you would expect it to. It can be just a real subtle tap, tap, tap. And you wanna be able to detect that with that fast tip. And the length of the rod is basically what type of fishing are you doing? If you're fishing from a boat, I would recommend a smaller uh, or a shorter rod just because they're not so clumsy in the boat and the larger length of rods for fishing from the bank in that it's able to easier for you to kind of maneuver down and deal with the fish on the shore with the longer rod. Um, the reel used is a casting or spinning reels are the common two used. Do not skimp on the reel. The reel is gonna be your best friend when you're battling these big fish. I recommend getting one with the good drag system that's can handle a lot of weight um, and then has enough line capacity to do what you need to do. And by that, I mean, um, I typically recommend using a heavier braid or monofilament and you wanna be able to get enough line on there to handle big runs by these fish. Um, like I said, personally, I use braid, 65 to 80 pound braid is typically what I use. They make it from 30 to 150 pound, but uh, I recommend just somewhere in the middle. I've, Good success with that. Uh, the rig I use for fishing and is very common for catfish anglers and bottom fishing in general is called a Carolina rig and that's off to the right hand side here. And that's just your main line coming from your eyelet down to a two-way swivel and in between there is uh, some type of slide sinker and the amount of weight that you need is ultimately going to depend on how much current is in the river so more current more weight and the recommendation here is just make sure that you got enough weight to make sure that you're keeping that bait on the bottom in the strike zone. And then from the two-way swivel, you next you go to your leader line. Now, this is more of a preference on the length you use. 
Um, I recommend like a foot to two feet. I know people have their preference based on current velocity. So longer leader maybe for a little less current and shorten it up if it's really, uh, really high current. And people can jazz them up with beads and spinners sometimes. And the last little bit is uh, I use a four to six hot circle hook. And we found that the circle hooks are far more effective for sturgeon than using the plain J hook or straight shank hook. And just the way they bite and the circle hook, if you've never used them, where the fish typically just kind of sets the hook on itself. So you'll be watching the rod in the rod holder and you'll feel the weight of the fish kind of pull down on it. And intuition is you want to grab it and set the hook where rather with the circle hook, it kind of just spins over in the side of the fish's mouth and you just reel down on it. And, uh, and the weight of the fish actually sets the hook for you. But once you got the fish on there, you can give it a, a little bit of a, another tug just to make sure it's there. Um, bait. So this is going to vary on where you're fishing, but night crawlers are king, especially up here. Um, other people like to use fish or fish parts as well. Um, very common up here to pair your night crawlers with uh, emerald shiners or fat heads, live or dead, but preferably fresh, fresh bait. Um, in order to fish for sturgeon, you just need a standard Minnesota fishing license. If you choose to harvest a sturgeon, you need to purchase a management tag, which I'll go over next. Some other equipment is a boat, a large landing net and measuring board, and those two in particular, the landing net and the board, should be capable of landing a fish what could be well over 100 pounds and measuring a fish that could be up to 80 inches. Gloves are very helpful for small sturgeons because they have those really sharp scoots on them, so it prevent damage to you and the fish. And sometimes bells are nice to clip on the end of your rod is another way to detect the light bites. And we have a, a variety of information on our area webpage. So if you look up uh, Badet Fisheries and you go to, <clears throat> we have a bunch of hyperlinks for these, uh, these advices and different techniques. But the big thing I want to drive home here is proper handling of sturgeon. And big fish in general, we recommend that once you get the fish in the boat, that you lay the fish on your lap and cradle the weight of the fish with both hands. And you should never grab any fish by that means by the gills or eyeballs. And in particular, large fish, whether this be sturgeon, large catfish, support the weight as shown in the pictures by the gals on the right hand side. Um, Holding them by the gills can be damaging to their gills and also cause internal damage as well. So that's how we recommend you holding the fish. Next, I mentioned that we tag fish and anglers often report these. So as I showed earlier, to be on the lookout for a tag at the base of the dorsal fin and do the best you can not to remove that tag. Landing nets can sometimes get tangled up in there and we, uh, we prefer you keep the tag in the fish. Then upon getting the fish in, it could have algae on it. So you just scrape that off to read the five digit code. From there, information that you're gonna need and I recommend writing it down is the date you caught the fish, the approximate location, whether you released the fish or harvested is critical, the approximate length of the fish, or just anything unusual if it was missing an eyeball or its tail fin. You can report that directly to our office or the preferred method is go to MNDNR tag fish reporting and you come here and you just click on report a tag fish. And it's a nice interactive map. You just click right on there and then the gives you all the information that you need, the species you caught, so lake sturgeon, whether you released it or not, um, tag removed, as I mentioned, keep that tag in there the best you can, location, catch comments. Now, I just wanna emphasize some things at the bottom here. Make sure that you're accurately filling out all the information for about the angler. There's often times where there's incomplete information or I need to reach out to you to confirm some information. And if I don't have proper contact information, um, you will not get the, the tag return back. And another thing to consider is while fishing on the Rainy River, you might not have the best cell service and you can't submit that out in the boat. 
So that's why I recommend writing it down and then submitting that once you uh, once you get back to an area with good cell service. And I do my best to get back as quick as I can on these tag returns, but depending on workload, it could be a week or two. Sometimes longer if we're real busy or I have a lot of them to do. So fishing regulations. So the emphasis is obviously on the Rainy River. So April 24th through May 7th is our spring harvest season. May 8th to the 15th is the catch and release season for a week. And then it's closed to fishing from May 16th to June 30th. July 1st to September 30th is our summer harvest season. And October 1st to April 23rd is catch and release only. Now, some important things with the or the harvesting seasons is that you're only allowed to harvest one sturgeon per calendar year. That means if you caught one in the spring, you won't be able to harvest another one until the following spring. Um, there's mandatory tag, mandatory harvest tags. So similar to um, if you were to hunt white-tailed deer, you would, uh, or when you go to buy your license, you just get a $5 management tag for sturgeon. And it's a two-part tag. The top portion is if you harvest a fish, you fill out the date of the catch, the length, and the, the water body that you harvested the fish from. And that is uh, the top portion is ripped off and mailed to the Bemidji Regional Office within 48 hours of harvesting the fish. And the bottom portion is this, the actual site tag that you need to affix to the, to the fish. And we have a picture there with a zip tie and you strap it onto the back of the fish. So that needs to be in your possession <clears throat> on the fish if it's in your possession. Statewide catch and release for sturgeon is the June 16th through April 14th. Um, it might close on March 1st on certain water bodies. So ice angling on the St. Croix River, I believe, ended the other day. So that was one of them that has a, a different date. There's also a harvest season on the St. Croix River below Taylor Falls, which is September 4th to the 30th. And that has a 60 inch minimum size limit, same as on the Rainy River. You need to have that mandatory harvest tag and register that to Bemidji. Lastly, I want to touch on our catch and release program. And this was implemented in uh, 2015 to honor anglers for their large uh, catch photo release catches. And there's four species that are honored right now Lake Sturgeon, Flathead Catfish, Muskie, and Northern Pike. And the current record holder is Darren Troseth with a 78 inch uh, Lake Sturgeon that was caught, I believe, on the, the St. Croix a few years back. But uh, that's a, it's a good one to beat. That's a big fish. So, same as I showed before, if you look up state record programs, you can learn more information about. The catch and release or just look up historic records there's a application you need to fill out and there's some criteria you'll need to look over there um, main one being that you get a accurate length that we can determine from the photo or video that we know the length of that fish um, the girth as well and you have to have a witness i believe and it's down to the eight, nearest eighth of an inch so So in summary, sturgeons have a unique life history that make them vulnerable to over harvest. And up here, the conditions we saw with um, the Rainy River are not unique. These are very common worldwide and the issues that sturgeons face. Um, some lessons we've learned looking forward, we've seen an increase in abundance, improved size structure, overall reproductive success in the, the Rainy River. And if you're interested in other conservation efforts, for other water bodies in Minnesota. Again, I know I'm sorry, I keep bringing all these DNR links, but there's a wealth of information out here. So if you just look up Lake Sturgeon, there's a nice species profile for it. Covers a lot of the same stuff I went over today. And then at the bottom, it goes over other conservation efforts that have gone on in Minnesota. And lastly, I just want to touch that there's several opportunities statewide in Minnesota, and we should be really grateful that we have these. Um, and I highly recommend getting out there and and trying to try to catch one of these things. It's a, it's enjoyable, and I guarantee once you get one on, you're gonna you're gonna know why. So, with that, thank you for your time. And there's my email address if you care to contact me.
Great, Brett. I find that the sturgeon management program has been one of the more fascinating histories and um, success stories that the Minnesota DNR has. It's, it's a fascinating story. You did a great job. Also, if you've never had a chance to fish for one of these fish, it is just an amazing experience um, to fish these fish. I've, I caught a large one with my son when he's younger. But we do have a few questions for you. And the first one is, John asked, how does it complicate the DNR sturgeon management when working with both tribal and Canadian counterparts? Sorry, could you, sorry, could you yep. repeat that question? Sure. How does it complicate the DNR sturgeon management when working with both tribal and Canadian counterparts? Um, we've had a great work. Can, am I muted or? You no, know? you're fine. Okay. Over the years, we've had a, a great working relationship with, uh, with working with the Canadians. And um, since I've been up here, I've not had a whole lot of experience of working with uh, the First Nations on the Ontario side. I know there's there's been issues here and there, but overall, um, I believe it's been a, 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 a fruitful relationship working with both sides, and then us working as well with uh, with uh, International Falls Office um, as well. So yeah. Um, Brett, can you uh, stop your PowerPoint? Then you'll become big again. The second question is from Bill. What is the minimum recommended line length on the spool? I think you said needed. You said enough, but not a number of yards. Like, what would you recommend for a number of yards on the spool? Well, that kind of is going to depend um, on line line diameter that you're using. Um, that's why I recommend braid, as you can get by with a higher pollen test at a lower diameter. Um, I just use what would be like a, it's a, not to endorse, but uh, Abu Garcia 6600. And I can't remember the exact line capacity on there, but I would say you're going to want at least a couple hundred yards, if not more. Okay. Um, do you collect spawn and raise sturgeon for stocking, or is it all natural reproduction? Um, that's natural reproduction. Us as our office does not do any hatchery. Um, First Nation has done hatchery work um, that's been used in the rehabilitation of Red River fishery on the North Dakota border. And they also uh, have used that program as well for other sturgeon lake sturgeon populations in the nation. But our office does not deal with hatchery, hatchery, hatchery operations. The next question from our own Brian Nairborn. If you fish in a lake environment, whoops, I lost the question. Um, what habitat should be targeted? Any particular depths or substrates? I have very, very limited experience with fishing for sturgeon on lakes. I have fished at Lake St. Croix, which is about the closest thing, and in the winter time, and I just went out in the middle of that and we caught one. So I guess I don't really have any. Uh, I guess that fishing for them in the lakes, I just don't have a lot of experience with. These are pretty mobile fish, so basically probably the same strategies is kind of just pick some points maybe to try off of off, off shorelines, and if you're not getting anything, move around. Okay, Nicola asked, how difficult is it to remove a hook if you're fishing alone? Are sturgeon docile? Um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you got a good set of pliers, the circle hook, you can just get in there and it comes out relatively easy, even though considering you're fighting a heavy fish. Um, the biggest challenge is if you're by yourself is just the being able to handle a large fish. That's where I recommend if if you can't get a, a big fish in the boat by yourself, it's best for you and the fish to try and maybe just remove the hook and let the fish be out in the, in the water without trying to panhandle it in. Right. From my experience, those fish are sharp. They have those scutes that are so hard to handle and, and they flop around when they're little, um, if you catch a little one. So it is, it is a, can be a challenge. Um, Tara asked, has there been talk about giving civilian anglers training to tag the sturgeon they catch? No, there has not, not as of currently. In the past, I know they've this is well before my time up here. We had civilians uh, tagging sturgeon. It was kind of a kind of a, a mess with trying to keep track of everything. 
So uh, presently, no, we are not. Please and one thing, we, one thing we did with the Becoming Outdoor Woman participants, we encouraged them to buy a tag, even if they're not harvesting a fish, just to help support the management. Um, once in a while, I lose the questions. Hold on. There are more. Is that water clarity is not important for sturgeon? Oh, in that water clarity is not important for sturgeon. Has there been any consideration to introducing the species to the Minnesota River? And perhaps they were in the Minnesota before it was polluted by turbidity. There is efforts already taking place for rehabilitating Lake Sturgeon in the Minnesota River. Um, Big Stone Lake being one. So yes, yeah, that's currently underway. And I, if you want more information on other water bodies, in particular on the Minnesota, um, Chris Dolmeyer out of Ortonville would be the best contact for, for that system. Okay, and uh, I think that's the last question that I could see, Craig. Do you see any more questions that popped up? Let's see, there might be one more. Do anglers keep and eat sturgeon? Are they good to eat? Is there a fish consumption advisory for Lake Sturgeon and the Rainy River? What contaminants are of concern? Um, as with any um, long or long lived fish, there would be a mercury contamination advisory. I'm sure that would go with it. Um, as far as eating them, I've I've had them. They they are good to eat. Um, there's several different ways of preparation on the grill or smoking them is very common. Was there was there more to that question, Linda? Um, any contaminations like any um, mercury would be the, the main oh, one. Just mercury, and that that would all still be on. Um, if you go to, I believe you can get that on our DNR Lake Finder. It has fish health consumption advisories. Okay, I have to scroll down to questions. They keep popping up here. Hold on. And is there a certain way of cleaning a sturgeon? Is it pretty difficult, or is it pretty straightforward? Or is there, there information on the DNR website? Uh, there is no information on the DNR website. Um, there is some considerations is that these are cartilaginous fish, being they don't have a skeletal, true skeletal system. Um, they have what's called a nodal cord. So it's a little different probably than what you'd be used to cleaning with fish and it's, it's a larger fish. So there is some consideration there, but if kind of similar to just cleaning off two fillets and just being cognizant of the of the nodal cord. Okay. And they do have uh they have fat layers between um their meat and depending on how you prepare that you may choose to cut that off or if you're smoking it you can probably just leave it on. Um next question is have you found that sturgeon have a preferred substrate for feeding? No. <laughs> That's the work we got underway. I've caught them in rocks and I've caught them in sand and silt. It just kind of kind of depends on the time of year, maybe what's available in there. If it's insects are available at the time or um, emerging insects from sand or silt, kind of more seasonal, really dependent, but common um, both. If you plan to catch and release only, do you need to buy a $5 tag? I know I just said that we encourage the people in our program to buy that tag just to help with management, but I can answer that. You do not need a $5 management tag, correct? Nope. Um, in reference to your long-term goals, do you think there are actually fish in the system that are over 80 inches? What is your strategy to sample a fish of that size? Oh, that's um, What's that? That's from Dennis Top. Um, yeah, good question, Dennis. Um, based on what we've seen with our netting, we have not seen them up to 80 inches yet. Um, we have some other gear types that we're looking at uh, using to assess uh, larger fish that aren't necessarily restricted to the size of mesh we use in our gill nets. And also it could come from verified through angler catches as well. And um, based on what I've seen from anglers is that I would say they're, they're very, very likely that there could be one that's close to 80 inches. We saw several that were well over the, the mid seventies this year, this past spring. So. And for the audience, Dennis top is an old DNR management person from up, up there in the sturgeon. He helped start the bow sturgeon fishing program. 
Uh, then Dennis also asked, please share examples of spawning fish that have been sampled multiple times during your annual sampling, sampling at the spawning site at Clemenston Rapids. Examples of what you know about the Rapid River? Uh, examples of spawning fish that have been sampled multiple times during your annual sampling, sampling at the, the Rapids up there. Like, have you caught the same fish over and over again? Oh, right, yeah. Um, I can't think of multiple recaptures of individual fish. I know there's plenty. I can't think of any individual ones. I just refer to the slide of the ones that we've caught at least one time, but uh, I don't have exact records of multiple recaptures. I know there's one individual fish he's probably referring to as, a, as an old male that they caught several times, um, time and time again. I can't remember if it was like four or five times, but. Okay, two last questions. Many length regulations, what is the proper way to measure a sturgeon? So um, what's um, in the DNR regulations is a total length. So from the tip of the nose, fold down the tail to the tip of the tail. Total length is how you would measure it. The, the longest part of the tail. Longest part of the tail, correct. Okay, and the last question, are the sturgeon in the Rainy River round, do they migrate out to the lake when not spawning? Oh, I, I think what he's saying is, are the sturgeon in the Rainy River year round and then they migrate out to the lake when not spawning or do they stay in the Right there, there has been thought of two kind of separate populations, ones that reside in the lake and then come in to spawn and ones that reside in the river. But the more we learn about these fish is that I believe there's a combination of both. I think they do spend a fair bit of time in the river and then there's some that, you know, are transients between both the lake and the river. Okay, and that was the last question. I'm going to ask you a question or just have you comment because there is a, the Canadian side of the, the water and then the Minnesota water side of the water. How can anglers make sure they're on the Minnesota side? Do they just use a GPS system or how do they figure that out? So the best way is to have, if you were to be encountered by a Canadian game warden is they will ask to look here. Do you have electronics that would show that side you know, the border itself. But if you don't have that, a good rule of thumb is know that approximately half of the river is gonna be your, your boundary and to make sure that you just maybe stick to a third or so over on the US side, just to be sure. Yep, and on those electronics it actually shows the boundary. Correct. Okay. Yep. That's all the questions I have, unless <laughs> I saw something directly that I didn't see. There's a question in the chat. Have you done any research on sturgeon population in the St. Croix River near Bayport or Stillwater? No, that, that would be a question for East Metro. They, they, that's the offices that manage St. Croix River. And there was one other question. I think you explained it already, but how to measure a sturgeon from the tip of the nose to the longest portion of the tail. Oh. Great. I think that's all the questions and we're pretty much out of time. Um, thank you very much, Brett, for sharing this information. It is a fascinating story and it's a wonderful um, uh, management story, a success story for the DNR to, to bring these, these historic fish back. And the fishery is just an incredible experience. It's kind of a bucket list uh, experience going up there to uh, Lake of the Woods. So thank you again. And um, I. Craig, can you say what the next session is on next Wednesday? I don't have it in front of me right now. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have it either, but next Wednesday, there'll be another what, seminar at noon. So thank you everybody for attending.